your plan, your life is iterative and there's going to be zigs and zags in your life. And so once your plan is spooled up, it should have that level of flexibility to incorporate those things. Most pilots don't understand what career opportunities are available in the world of aviation. They're making career decisions based on advice from friends or posts on internet forums, meaning they're taking huge risks with their livelihood without having all the details. This podcast was created to help you understand the aviation industry so you can find your dream job. Let's get ready for pushback. Here's your host and my dad, Nick Fialka. Hey, pilot. Welcome back to Ready for Pushback. I'm Nick Fialka. I'm so glad you're joining me today. If you're watching on the YouTubes, what's up? If you're listening on your podcast uh, platforms, thank you for listening. If you got a chance would you do me a favor and leave me a little review on Apple Podcasts? That's really helpful. And I'm trying to just like boost those up this year. So that's what we're doing. Today's guest, none other than Timothy P. Pope, certified financial planner, talking about aviation finances. That's us today. I love having Tim on the podcast and uh, um, all his information. You know, he's a longtime sponsor of the show. So all his information's in the show notes. And uh, I'm, I'm just super thankful that he's with me. So sit back, relax. Let's get ready for pushback. Hey, pilot, did you just get a new conditional job offer? Are you getting out of the military and going to move your family across the country? Are you going to move in base somewhere? Or are you going to go out to find that second home that you've been looking for? Well, I want you to stop right now pick up the phone and call Marty and the team at Trident Home Loans. It's an organization that's run by pilots. They understand pilot pay. They understand contracts. They understand military. They have the best VA loans in the United States. Marty and his team have been doing mortgages for years. They've been doing my mortgages for years. I trust him and his team more than any other organization. I challenge you to get a better deal anywhere else. Go ahead, reach out, get a mortgage quote, and then call Marty and his team. They will walk you through the process and show you how competitive their rates are. So go right now, tridenthomeloans.com and check them out. All right, Timothy P. Pope, dude, what's up? Certified financial planner in the house, dude. How are you? Doing well, Nick. Doing well. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Uh, well, right before we started recording, I had to fill up my water which is right here. It's a nice it's, little bottle of water. It's summertime. You got to stay hydrated. Yeah, I do. And it's important. <laughs> and so I walk over to the, the, like the podcast studio is also the like an extra room, right? But it's got a bathroom. So I go to fill this thing up. I look in the sink and there's M&Ms in the sink, just stuck to the bottom of the sink because my kids, I don't know what they're doing. I don't. I don't even know where M and M's come from. I don't know if we buy M and M's, Tim. What do we because do? Because it's it's uh, it's it's summertime, right? And the kids are enjoying themselves. M and M party in the bathroom. Uh, your Better kids check with are, Anna. Maybe your kids are full of responsibility, <laughs> though. Like they don't do stuff like that. Oh, <laughs> I wish. It's a it's a catch and correct, man. It's uh, catch and it's correct. a it's a catch and correct. You know. I heard you went to Carowinds. We did. That was so much fun. Uh, it was so much fun, man. Like this is, thanks for asking about that. So the, uh, one of my kids, it, it was, it was their first time we took the two oldest and one of them was just so full of like, they, they were talking a big game. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm riding this ride and so on and so forth. I mean like weeks before the trip. And by the way, like, um, yeah, so um, a client of, of, of ours, uh, came up. And so it was a joint, like, you know, our kids got together and took care of it. So that was super fun, but it was right off. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but I Bro, should it's have. a total write off. Let's go. Yeah. I should, I should, I, I, yeah, I need to think about that. So, uh, the books aren't closed. So anyway, so they're talking all this game and, um, and I said, Hey man, like, look, like this is our first time. Like you need to, you need to go and see the sights and smell the smells and hear the sound before, you know, you're bragging about all the things that you're going to do. And so we get in and, uh, and they're looking around and you've got this huge 300 foot roller coaster and it gets to the top. 
top and like people are screaming for their life and there's the thunder of the cars going down. And I'm like, Hey, you going to do that? And they're like, Nope. So we went to the kitty section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was all good. It was all good. They'll be back this summer and, um, uh, and enjoy it. But how was your vacation? Uh, it was good. You know, we went down to Pensacola and rented a beach house and played on the beach and had a lot of fun. It's just a beautiful town. It's one of the greatest towns in America. Um, I love that place. We had a lot of fun, but I think back to when a couple years ago we went to the Texas state fair. And if you've never been to the Texas state fair, I implore you to put it on your list of places to go before you die, because it's just such a crazy experience. And but it's my bigger little, than all the other state fairs. Yeah, it's huge. Oh my gosh, it's wild. <laughs> my little Kate, who does the intro on the show, she wanted to write, she was talking a big game too. She wanted to get mm-hmm. on one of the roller coasters and just spin, spin, spins. Mm-hmm. They sit her down, they buckle her in, they started spinning that thing. And she she about had a panic attack. She was screaming so hard. And they stopped the ride. I've never <laughs> seen them stop a ride before. And they helped her get off and she was boohooing that poor sweet girl. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, All right. And we're talking about this for a real reason. And the reason is because I want to talk with you. I want to jump around. We were going to talk about one thing, but we'll we'll talk talk about that next. But um, one of the things that I have been thinking about and dealing with a lot with uh, my family is the fact that I want, I want my kids to have a feeling of responsibility with money and to understand it. When I grew up, there was no money and it was, you know, there was nothing and, and there was like no actual training on that. And I wanted to get your take about how do you, what do you do with you, with, you know, your kids and, and as a father and a financial planner and all the things, how do you teach the value of money and, and being responsible and um, a good steward, you know, all of those things are, you could do, you could go a bunch of different ways with it. So what do you guys do? Yeah. So that's a really good question. It's, it's on my mind a lot for obvious reasons, like you say, as a, as a financial planner and, you know, wanting to teach my children, um, you know, just, just, uh, first of all, have a financial literacy and then think about, you know, financial responsibility as well. So some of the things that we do is for every dollar that they get, they have to save and invest 50% of it. That's birthday money. That's gift cards. That's if they do a little something for somebody and they get some extra cash, um, save and invest 50%. And then, and then, and then, so we've been doing it long enough to where they know, uh, the, the, the younger ones that couldn't care less, they'll get birthday money and just be like, here, dad, here's $10. Can you, can you invest this for me? And so we do. And, um, and, and, and the key too, is that for every dollar they invest, I match as well. So, um, so for the older ones though, they will, um, you know, some of them, they, they all have different spirits, right? So some of them get it and they understand that, you know, one, I was talking to one and I said, Hey, I really appreciate this job that you did, uh, for they mowed the grass. And I mean, it was like, man, I, I came home and I was looking at it and I'm like, they come out and they're like, is that a happy dad? I mean, I just had a big old smile on my face. Cause I, I you know, the first couple of times was like, Hey, this, we got to work on quality, but we're there. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is amazing. So I said, hey, you know, I might, you know, pass you a couple of bucks for that. And they said, okay, well, great. Well, I'm just going to give it right back to you. So you can invest it and then you have to match what you just gave me. <laughs> I'm like, good for you. Uh, so so they're, they're getting that. Whereas others, it's more of like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to. But regardless of where you make your money, whether it's hey, you're saving for retirement in the future, whether it's taxes, right? There's a top line that you earn and then there's the net that you spend off of. And I want them to get used to, hey, there's a difference there. Um, the last thing that and I'll share, it was, uh, it was really neat hearing one of my kids, there's a thing that they want to buy. And they were 
talking to me and they said, well, dad, you know, it costs this amount. And if I make this much money over this amount of time, and here's what I love. They said, after I save and invest 50% of that or half of that, then it's going to take me X amount of time to get enough money to, to, to make that purchase. And, uh, oh, that just, that warmed my heart because you could see it click and they're starting to think in those terms that number one, there's no instant gratification. Number two, first things first, let me pay myself. Number three, I've got to, you know, save for the thing that I want. So, um, that's one of the things that we do there, you know, folks can do a lot of things there and there's, there's several others, but, um, yeah, that's, that's one. Timothy P. Pope is a certified financial planner dedicated to guiding professional pilots through smart financial planning. Whether it's saving for retirement, investment management, a seamless military transition, or strategic tax planning, Tim is your trusted financial partner. Also, you can join Tim as he leads engaging discussions on personal finance and strategies for professional pilots on the brand new Pilot Money Podcast. Timothy P. Pope helping professional pilots make the most out of life. Yeah, that's cool. We do. So with my kid, with my older kids, my bigs, right? My, for Sadi and Kate, they're always interested. They're always interested in, in being a success. And how do you, how do you make it in the world as a job? They're thinking about doing well in school and all these things. And for Sadi, he, he wants to own a business. He wants to own a business. And we had, I don't even know if you and I have spoken about that before, but he wanted to do all this business stuff and has all these ideas. Maybe I could, you know, make origami and sell origami at school or this or that, or the, whatever, whatever the, you know, 12 year old idea of a good way to make money is. And I, I said, well, why don't you just buy into a business and you can buy into lots of businesses. And we started this conversation about the stock market and how you can be part owner of a business. What do you like? Oh, you like, you like movies, you like things on, you know, whatever it is, is it Netflix? Is it Disney? Is it Amazon or Apple or whatever? And we'll go and buy a little bit of stock here and a little bit of stock there based on what he thinks is interesting. And then we watch the performance. We have uh, every day he has to hop on uh, and, and look about how his stocks are doing and how his portfolio is doing. And as it's grown, we've had it per f- since I was at the regional. So that's been a few years already. And he saves this kid, man. He mowed the lawn. We have, I mean... My lawn takes like five hours to mow. We have a push mower and we have an acre and a half of land. And this kid, and it's not flat. It's oh, it's not nice, but he, he'll he crush it. He'll go out there and spend most of the day mowing the yard. And, and then he did that while I was gone on this last trip. I got back, yards mowed. I was like, wow, dude, great job. And he said, would you put that money in my stocks for me? And he loves, he loves that seeing it grow. And now we have, we, we talk about that and, and the idea of also, um, the, the employer match for sure with his, with his paycheck. But I also started doing for each of my kids, uh, a monthly investment that they each get a certain amount of money each month into their portfolio. And I tell them, here's what we talk about. This is probably like, I'm not a financial advisor or anything, but I tell them like, this is your, this is your first retirement fund. This money is not, this is not for today's for Saudi or today's Kate. This is for like, when you turn 60 is when I'm going to allow you to pull this out and it's going to have millions of dollars in it. And they like blows their mind, right? Because they could you could have 20 or 50 or a hundred thousand dollars in an, in an account when you're 20 and waste it. Cause I know two people that have had that and their kids have squandered it. And it's, it's sad to see. Um, so I don't know. How do you handle that? Yeah. Well, I think what you're describing, you know, cause sometimes folks will come to me and say, Hey, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to create generational wealth for my family 
for my children, right? And it's like, okay, so generational wealth, this is, this is you know, a level of, of wealth that you are not going to use in your lifetime, so you pass it along. When you look at the stats, in America at least, and going back for a long time, it's somewhere to the tune of about 80% of millionaires are first generation, okay? That means they haven't inherited any money from, from their parents or anything else. So I like that Fasadi's thinking about business ownership and, and he can work hard. I mean, goodness, in the Georgia sun and an acre and a half uphill. That's ridiculous. <laughs> That's some good, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're building a good core there. So he's got what it takes. But what I tell people is one of the biggest things that you could do to give your child a leg up is be a great financial example. Because to your point, by the fact that, you know, you're encouraging your children to engage with their own dollars, to invest their own dollars, to earn their own dollars, to, to uh, participate in delayed gratification, um, they will, it'll become part of their DNA. And the clients that I see who have had just a good example, they're not starting with any inheritance or nothing yet, but just a good example, they start to do this own behavior on their own. And then the ones that I see who have had a good example and they've had some inheritance, they continue to do that behavior. But like you said, the two people that you know in your life who may have not had the best example or, or education surrounding you know, uh, financial literacy, the saying is true, easy come, easy goes. And, um, and so, you know, you can, you can get a windfall. Look at how many lottery winners are still <laughs> are, are still wealthy, right? It, it usually doesn't happen. Um, so I say that being a really good financial example, another thing that I've done, and of course, I mean, there's no right or wrong. And I mean, I don't expect other people to do, to do the things that I do. But um, when I, the example that I saw in my family was one of my parents, their parents really, really valued education, right? So that would be my grandparents really valued education because they didn't have any, or they didn't have, you know, what, what they could have had, maybe if they're, if the uh, the circumstances were different. So what they passed along to my parents was like, look, I'll bend over backwards for education, but if it's going to be a toy, if it's going to be a game, or it's going to be some kind of other spend, then I, you know, I want you to come up with that. And so intentionally or not, uh, we were at the bookstore, you know, some months ago and kids were, wanting to make some purchases. One wanted a toy and one wanted something more instructional. Dad kind of pitched in with the one that was more instructional and for the toy. He's like, hey, you got that. Um, and so not saying I don't buy my kids toys. I do. I do. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's, uh, you know, you, there, there's, there's life lessons in all of this. Because it's like, oh, huh, that's interesting. And the other thing is, when they go to make, it was so funny. Uh, it was around that same, or a little bit after that, one of the kids were buying something. Uh, it was a drone or something like that. And they had calculated down to the penny, down to the sales tax of what they were going to spend. And they you know, put all the money down on the cash register. And I like them doing that. I want them to have that physical relationship and that interaction with the ca- you know, the cashier and everything. Um we were off by a penny because I had rounded up the cost of the item. And I was like, oh, my bad. I rounded it up. So that's why your, your numbers would have been right. So, you know, it's all, it's fun. It's good fun to, to take them along. That's good. Hopefully you chipped in the penny. <laughs> that was changed. They had that. It was a- <laughs> oh, man, that's awesome. Yeah, one of the things we're doing now, which has become the bane of my existence, is uh, I've agreed to we're going to get chickens. And my mm. kids want to do a little farm stand mm, and, uh, mm-hmm. and sell eggs. To sell the eggs? Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And so we're going to give it a try. And the they see me having, you know, with the podcast and the businesses and the things that we do. And they're asking like, hey, do we need to form an LLC? And who's going to do our taxes? And this and that. And the other. I was like, we're just going to sell eggs at the street, y'all. Like... Yeah, I just maybe I'm creating my own monster here. It's uh, it's no we'll, man. I'll I, report back. 
oh, this is, I love it. The one, so who is fronting the money for the chicken and the, <sighs> the coop and all that? Are you? I am. My God. All right, so you're you're investor number one, man. They you got to let them That's know right. you expect a return, right? Like oh, either how, did you structure it on equity so you could lose out, or is it a debt and they got to pay you back? Oh, oh don't even. Man. This is out of control. Man. I just I love thought it so much. <laughs> I just agreed to build a chicken coop for a birthday present. Little. Oh, it was a gift. I it see. Gift. All right, so make sure you fill out your seven oh nine. Oh. My life. Yeah. I bet some tax man listens to this show. Oh my gosh. Um, but you know what? I love your point about generational wealth because a lot of pilots think about, especially, um, it depends where you are on your journey, right? You can be at the beginning of your journey where there's like only outlays of cash and it's only, you're only spending money. Or you could be in that transition period where you're going from your regional and then hopefully have an opportunity to go to a major and you just start getting settled. And that right there, um, when you have this excess money that inevitably will show up, it might seem light, you know, light years away now, but at some point it's going to show up. And, and you need to be able to manage that properly because if you don't, if you don't and you leave it on the table, or you leave it, it, it is structured poorly, that you are doing, you'll do a disservice to your children. And that's, you are not going to give them any blessings. You're going to actually be a detriment to them with that money. Um, and so that brings me to this idea is what is it like, you know, I would, I would think, I need to get a plan together. So if I need, if I feel like, hey, I need to get a plan together, I've been listening to Nick and Tim talk for the past almost two years. W talk to me about what it's like starting to work with you. What is the process? Like I pick up the phone, I call you, or I send you an email, and then what do we do? How does this work? Yeah. So I can't believe we've never talked about this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, these things take time, right? So thanks for asking that question. And I think, you know, this will give the listener that kind of, you know, everybody, we're all pilots. We stay in front of the airplane. We like to know what to expect. We don't like surprises. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So say somebody wants to uh, start to say, take the relationship to the next level. Um, what we do is give us a call or schedule an appointment um, with the link. You probably can find it in the show notes to this show. Uh, so you, you you go there with the appointment. There's a few pre-appointment questions. So we're going to ask all the usual stuff that you would expect when you meet with a financial planner, like um, or at least a planner who focuses on aviation. We want to know, hey, what airline do you fly for? Um, are you business aviation, military, that kind of thing? Uh, we're going to want to know your household annual income, um, your investable assets, right? Uh, we also we're going to want to know like what are you trying to solve? What's your biggest pain point right now? Um, and then, so you fill all of that out and you, and then you schedule the appointment. When we have that first appointment, um, this could come as a surprise, but you know, we're usually not dispensing financial advice. Uh, we are, we're all listening, right? So we, we're going to sit down, uh, for that appointment. We're going to have questions for you, but we're all ears about what you have going on, uh, where you've been, what you're trying to accomplish and what you want out of a planner relationship. And then we let you turn the tables and you ask us questions, right? So what's the process like? What are the service like? What are the cost? And at the end of that meeting, while uh, we don't expect a decision, you know, day one, but what we want is we want for, you know, a prospective client to have a really good feel of, hey, does this fit my needs, right? And so that's that's the first meeting. Once you decide you make your go or your no-go decision, that's when the rubber you know hits the road. So now we're looking at um, a document review meeting where we're going to pull in all your state, all the goodies that you could expect, tax returns and so on. Um, we are really drilling down in terms of your goals, you know, life goals that have corresponding financial implications. Uh, to make sure that those things align. And the, the document review is where we've looked over everything and then we have clarifying questions. We want to make sure that we're on the same page and we're really clear about your goals um, and, and the documents that you have. After that, 
it's off to the races with the first draft of your financial plan. And I like to tell folks that your plan, your life is iterative and there's going to be zigs and zags in your life. And so once your plan is spooled up, it should have that level of flexibility to incorporate those things. Uh, and so that's what we'll do. Look at the plan. And then after the plan uh, meeting, usually there's a big list of action items. Uh, but, you know, if you give me 10 or 15 things to do and say in an area that I'm not an expert in, I might struggle to do them. So we just break them up and prioritize them and take small bites of the apple and just keep moving forward on those action items there. And that's essentially how, how the work gets done um, is, you know, from first meeting to, you know, hey, we've implemented the plan and now we're having subsequent planning meetings to, to work on the action items um, or if we've settled into like a quarterly cadence or a spring and a fall cadence. So. Yeah, I imagine there's a couple there's a couple different tranches of people, right? There's there's people that have, a, have their, understand their, their finances and where they want to go and and what they're doing and we're moving forward together and then there's the other side of that coin where it's i don't know i just i'm a pilot i'm i'm making a little money now i'm just a little of this or a little of that but i don't know what i don't know i don't even know the questions to ask and what i want is to be to have a a, a safety net and to be be able to save for my future so that I can retire so that maybe my, maybe I can help pay for my kids' colleges or maybe I can leave money behind or this, that, or the other. I don't know any of this stuff. How do I get, how do I get it figured out? And that's because it's a scary place to be. I think a fear, it would be something that keeps people from calling. Yeah. So I think that you you hit that nail on the head because we so often folks will say near the, you know, the end of that first meeting, like, wow, I came in and I really only expected investments. Right. But as we talk, there's all this other stuff that goes, that, uh, that goes hand in hand. And I like to tell folks that, you know, like the engines on your jet, right? Like I, I look at the investments, like the engines on your jet they'll get you to where you need to go. But as a pilot, you need to know a whole lot more than just how to turn them on to, to arrive on time and safely. And that's all the other aspects of the, of the financial plan. And so um, in your case, where you talk about somebody who says, hey, I've got some big picture stuff like retirement and college, um, we'll, get, we'll get started on those things. And then part of what we do is a cash flow analysis. So if you are... Uh, let's say your early career, and maybe you're not feeling like there's a lot of extra cash flow, you will have the capability to see future cash flows. If you say upgrade to captain, if you go from regional to airline, if you um, change equipment, right, we can run all those scenarios. And then there's a part of the system that I call a leaky bucket, but it's essentially spend unsaved cash flow. And that's where if a client is not sure of their goals, um, we can say, hey, like, look at this. This says that we expect you to have this much above and beyond what your bare necessities are. What could that do for you and your family? Um, another thing that will help that 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 if for folks who don't uh, know exactly what they want to do is in the first meeting, a lot of times we'll say, hey, I'll say, hey, money aside, tell me what life goals you have. If we didn't have to think about money, what would you be doing? How would you be spending your time if health and money were not an issue? And then we can pencil some of those things in and say, okay, well, these sound like they may be important to you. What if we can assign some resources to, to help you pursue or accomplish those things? I love it. That's important. I think that I think that what you're saying is it's a lot more than just thinking about retirement. It's an entire, it's, it's an entire structure for every phase of your life. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, true financial planning, like when you, when you look at some of the resources that we have, like retirement is retirement planning is one circle out of like eight, right? Investment mm -hmm. advice and investment management are two out of like eight. And then there's all these other things and it's, and I'll tell folks, I'm like, look, you're here 
Maybe you want to go out till age 65. That's cool. There's a lot of life in between that. Even if you're 55 years old and 65 is in 10 years, there's a lot of life in between 55 and 65. And then once you hit 65, it's not like it's all over. There's a lot of life after that, right? And so being spooled up with a financial plan that can help you peek behind, peek into the financial future um, is really helpful because then you can, you know, you can evaluate your course of action, right? Hey, pilot, does your pilot uniform make a short flight feel like a transcon slog? Flight uniforms have reinvented aviation shirts with 3D stretch, stain repellents, and no wrinkles. These shirts are just plain comfortable and ready for takeoff right out of your rollerboard. Flight uniform is trusted by more than 25,000 pilots and their flagship flight shirt has over 1,500 five-star reviews. I've worn every pilot shirt out there. And if you know me, you know I only wear flight uniforms. Be the envy of every cockpit at flightuniform.com and get a special podcast exclusive discount with the code SPITFIREPOD20 to take 20% off your first order at flightuniform.com. Let's talk a little bit about the, the one thing I've been thinking about a lot is I'm 45 when you're tired, you know, you can tire it. 65, you're going to retire at 60 or 55 or whatever it is. One of the big, probably the biggest burden financially, other than like college stuff is, is going to be your house and paying off your house. And do you feel like, what has your, your experience been? Um, because I can, I can certainly see the idea of um, having your house all paid off when you are hit your, the day you want to retire, because that's going to take off, it'll probably save you, I don't know, a third to 40% of your, um, of your monthly spend, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So when we think about, I'm going to get to the mortgage question in a minute, Okay. but I want to just frame, frame this concept and this idea of retirement before we retire, what are we doing? We're saving money. We're investing money. Okay. Why are we doing it though? And the reason that we're do that we're doing it is because when we step away from a job, if I wasn't military and I don't have a pension, it's because I'm going to need to fund my lifestyle somehow, some way. So we're saving in all these accounts against a time where we're going to create cash flow out of those accounts. And so to your point, a mortgage is an obligation that is part of your cash flow if you carry it into retirement. One of the ways that you think that, that you could um, uh, increase the, the probability of your portfolio lasting and you not running out of money, because that's the name of the game in retirement is to not run out of money. That's like rule number one. <laughs> Aha, let me write that down. So, <laughs> so, so if, you, um, if you can offload that mortgage and have that coincide with uh, your retirement, then that's less cash flow that you're going to have to figure out where to co- come from. Should it come from Social Security? Alert! If you've seen the last Social Security reports, they're not rosy. Um, should it come from pension? Well, hey, if I don't have a pension, right, where am I going to get the cash flow from? Oh, it's going to come from my investments. So if you are a pilot and you're making strong income and you got a mortgage in the last couple of years that like make you wince whenever you look at the statement because the interest rates are high, six, 7% kind of thing. Then having that mortgage, um, retiring that mortgage by the time that you, you retire can make a lot of sense. Yeah. That's been, we've been thinking about that at our house a lot as far as, um, trying to put extra money every single month toward our mortgage to try, I've got, let's see, I'm 45. So it gives me 20 years, right? So I'm not really good at math, but if I, as long as if I can figure out my mortgage payback glide slope and get it below 20, if that's the, if that's the year I want to retire, I haven't even thought about that. Um, but you know, if so, then that's a, that to me is a good thing because it's also tricky because 
if I had bought a house 10 years ago and I lived in that house 10 years ago, my mortgage might be twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars. Or you buy a house today, you buy the same dang house and it's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and you've got yourself close to a five thousand dollar mortgage or maybe slightly more. I, I've, I've been talking to more and more and more people about what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to afford my life, a life, any life? How am I supposed to even save for the future when all I can do is, is drown because of a mortgage or I'm just going to rent forever? My last first officer, that's what we talked about a lot of the time, um, was the fact that he was in his thirties. He's like, dude, like, what do you want me to do? Buy a, buy a three quarter of a million dollar house. That's just okay. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's the worst. Yeah. No, it does. It does present challenges. And this is where uh, I think on the ad read, we talk about like smart financial decisions or something like that. And, you know, and this is what it comes down to, because let's say for your 30 year old, um, I'm not encouraging folks that are not in their forever home to throw extra money at the mortgage. I'm just not because historically, like we, I mean, we, we, we know that the markets have ups and downs, the real estate market, commercial real estate's get hammered right now, by the way, but, um, but even residential, you know, these things go up and down, but if you're not at your forever home, okay. And you plan to move, you can pay the minimum on your mortgage, allow the market, hopefully to provide some equity. And then when you exit that, you're going to have that equity. And then in the meantime, you've taken your, your excess cash flow and you've redirected it to somewhere else. I mean, a lot of times, the, the younger you are, the more competing financial goals that you have. And so you've got to figure out like what the right balance is. But as you, as you kind of settle down on that, that final stretch, that does give you opportunity to make some other advanced decisions like, hey, do we pay extra on the mortgage to uh, because particularly because the interest rate is, is very high. I mean, you know, clients who, who, you know, bought a mortgage, like if you said 10 years ago, I mean, you might be at like two and a quarter, right. Uh, you know, or two, I've had clients at 1.9 something uh, on a mortgage. And so they may not be motivated to, to pay that off uh, very quickly. All things considered, if they've got, you know, sub, you know, strong cash flows for retirement. So. There's a lot that goes into the decision. There is. It's a lot. And it's not easy. And that's, and I, you know, I bring this up because these are the things when I'm sitting in the flight deck and I'm talking, I'm, you know, I'm a middle of my aviation career ish, if you look at it on a 40 year scale. Right. And, and so the people that I'm, I'm flying with, like, these are the discussions we're having. These are conversations that like almost every single sequence I'm having this discussion. Um, and it just, it, it perpetuates. So I love being able to kind of bounce this off of you and, and talk with you about this stuff, because I love that idea of like, Hey, if you're moving more often, why, you know, it's, it doesn't behoove you to start paying extra payments and stuff like that. I think about my military folks and, and those, those kind of people, um, a friend of mine, a dear, dear friend who lives in Florida, th- when he graduated from college, he got a job doing sales and that he knew that was like, Hey, this is my job. So they bought a house out of college and he has just been like dumping his money in, trying to pay it off. When he was 35, he paid off that house wild 30 year mortgage paid off early as can be like he would take every piece of, of bonus check he ever got and just keep pouring it in. House is paid off. It's great. Um, but that's a, that's a guy that had the same thing for a long, long period of time. And that's a tricky thing for the airlines because it takes the, the glide slope is longer to get to that point where there's, there's long-term stability where, you know, like, Hey, I'm either going to be here or I'm going to be fired. And that's where you're going to be set. Well, you know, with your friend, I mean, being in sales, maybe there were some uneven cash flows. And so he was trying to insulate against that risk. Like, hey, what if I have an extended dry season, um, right? Because sometimes when it rains, it pours kind of thing. And so he wanted to be mindful there. Um, sounds like he knew he was going to stay in the property. Um, the one thing that, you know, I really ask folks to do 
because you know you can listen to personalities that are on shows who've been on shows for many many years and they're like look you pay down every penny of debt before you think about investing and and i have trouble with that uh because the power of compounding works on both sides of the ledger sheet right and so you know for some folks that say maybe they're coming out of school with loans and maybe they jumped into our house a couple of years ago and in their mind, hey, I've got to pay down eh, all of this before I start investing. Well, if you do that, sure, you're saving on interest, but your money does not have as long of a time frame to grow for you in the market. And that is an extremely important factor. Like your kids are going to be the next Warren Buffett. Why? Not because they... I mean, maybe they will be a genius bit investing, but likely because they're starting under age 10 years old and they're going to live to age, you know, 85, 90, and they've got all the 75 years of compounding returns. That's why, I mean, you know, Warren, Warren, I mean, you know, he's so wealthy because he stayed in the game for so long and was so consistent. And he live. he's going to live forever too. So that's the other side. <laughs> oh man, listen, dude. I appreciate you coming on the show. I appreciate our conversations because it helps me grow. And I know that the pilots that I speak to that, uh, you know, I, I meet them in the airports all over the U S and everybody is just so thankful that you are part of our, our team. And so remember anybody listening, you can just hop to the show notes. I've got Tim's info in there. Um, and I'll, it's, it's just an easy, easy conversation to start. And if you're worried about it or nervous about it, don't just go. It's easy. So thanks for being with us today, bud. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for having me. This was uh, great fun as always. Of course. Well, I'm going to, I got to get outside and work on this chicken coop. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that, uh, that, no, that's a lot of fun. So tell me, tell me if you change your mind, if it's not a gift and it's some kind of other structure and we get some work. Oh my God, this is so stressful. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. Dude, Tim, you're awesome. I'll catch you later, buddy. All right. See you, Nick. Thanks. All right, pilots. That's the episode. I hope you've really enjoyed it. But before you go, do me a quick favor, subscribe to my show and leave me a review. Give me a one-star review if it was totally worthless. Give me a five-star review if it was the most amazing thing you've ever heard. I want to hear from you. So if you can give me a review, subscribe to the podcast, make yourself a little bit better. I will be happy. You'll be happy. We'll keep crushing. I cannot wait to see you on the next episode.